weeks ago. We were here, it seems like, just last week, and I'm sure some of you are probably like, yeah, Greg, uh, we were here just last week. But we started this training, you'll notice we're on session two, and probably the majority of the room is sitting here going, did I miss something? Uh, now, what we actually did, uh, it didn't necessarily work out calendar-wise. We're trying to do these on Fridays to make it easier for you guys. I'm sure there's no great day to do training uh, in the world of PMs, superintendents, and estimators, but we're trying to find something rather than take you out midweek and then send you back to your job. But we landed on Friday, so we are here with all things operational excellence. That's actually what we're going to be focusing on today. A uh, couple quick things. Uh, as uh, you heard from the introduction, I'm actually uh, from FMI. FMI is a consultancy. We have been in business for about almost 70 years, and we only work with construction organizations like Benning. I've been with FMI for about 15 years. Prior to that, I worked for a company in Clearwater, very similar to Benning, as a senior project manager. And then before that, I worked in Lakeland, Florida, uh, where I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with one of your big clients is from, uh, where I was doing heavy civil work. So I come from the business and then migrated over now. Uh, they say those that cannot do, teach. So I guess that's probably the, the best example. But um, I actually run the Florida office of FMI, and that's why I'm here. A few years back, uh, and actually, uh, Randy will be able to tell you, I was here working with you guys. You were actually part of that class, and uh, as we found out, you're now doing summer school here. So yeah. uh, see what happens if you don't pay attention the first time around. <laughs> no, it's uh, in all seriousness. Hey, welcome. How you doing, man? In all seriousness, uh, hey, you know, we were kind of working with, we'll call it the executive leadership team, and you know, talking about the transition and where we were going. So. This uh, is probably, we'll call it an extension, we'll call it 2.0 version of that, and obviously a much bigger group. What do we, there's, uh, that first time around there was seven people, including yourself. So uh, suffice to say, we've grown considerably. Um, as I said, this subject uh, is very near and dear to all of your hearts, because this is where the money is made and lost. With this group, you are on the front line of what we do every single day, Number two, it's all things best practices, operations. So we're going to have some fun with it today. Uh, we're also, mainly because hearing the sound of my own voice all day would be very painful. Uh, so there's a lot of tabletop exercises where I'm going to ask you guys to work together to contribute. Hence the reason why you're in this fancy table configuration. Other than so you can see uh, my shining face in the morning. Um, we'll go through some logistics really quick. I know you all are familiar with this building, but if you don't, the uh, restrooms are in the fitness center, and if you don't know what a fitness center is, like myself, it's the building that has all the uh, weights and uh, exercise stuff. So just go in there, you got a men's room and a ladies room. I think since it's basically, what is it, 35 men and one woman, we can, can we use your restroom? Yes. Okay. <laughs> So uh, we're also going to take I'll breaks. I know there's a very important question in the back about how many breaks we're taking. Uh, we will be taking breaks. Uh, so uh, there's usually some natural point. Wow, that was quick. He's already on break. <laughs> we are going to take some breaks. But uh, if your break doesn't coincide with my break schedule, we're all adults. Feel free to step out. Obviously, we don't want, uh, hopefully, you kind of prepped your crews and your job sites that you'd be tied up today, um, but I do understand how the world works, so if you have to take a call, just step outside. However, if your cell phone goes off during this program, and what I mean by that is those fancy ringtones like this guy up here, you gotta really, I don't know what ringtone that was, but I feel very jazzy there for a moment. Hey, no problem, I get it, I can work through distractions, I, I've done this for 15 years. However, I need four volunteers a little bit later, so you might just nominate yourself if you happen to have a cell phone go off. Also, we do have breaks. If you don't come back from breaks sometime, what kind of discussion would productivity be if we didn't, weren't efficient? So if you happen to come back from a break late, guess what? You might become a volunteer. So we're going to have some good times today. Uh, lunch will be brought in at about 11.45-ish. 
you know, the idea with lunch uh, is we've got Jason's Deli, so hopefully everyone will have a great appetite. Um, all I need to do is scarf down a sandwich really quick and chug a bottle of water and I can be ready to go. Uh, so I don't need an extended break time. If you guys, which I'm sure this will not meet any opposition, want to get rolling after say 25, 30 minutes, we'll do it. If you need longer, no problem, but I'm sure a lot of you want to beat that wonderful Atlanta traffic today. Um, so we can uh, just opt for uh, trying to be efficient with our breaks and lunch and get you out if that makes sense for everybody. But once again, I don't want to shortchange you. I do know you have other things going on in the world. So uh, yeah, once again, we'll see where we are at that point in time. Uh, this is not a typical classroom where you can't ask questions. In fact, I encourage you to. Um, I know all of you are very shy and introverted, so uh, please, if I say something completely uh, either wrong or you don't understand it or you'd like clarification, stop me, please. Um, the folks that were in here for one of our first sessions know that it's a discussion, not a dictation. I'm not a preacher on a pulpit. My hypocrisy can only go so far, so uh, I want to keep it a dialogue going here. As you heard, we do have an exercise a little bit later where I do need a volunteer, rather four of them. Uh, quick comment on that. I talked with Mr. Benning, uh, I guess a couple weeks ago. I got with Rice, I got with the leadership team, uh, of which you know uh, Darcy has been sitting in on some of our sessions, and we all mutually agreed that, you know, Publix sounds great. The theater business sounds great. Uh, I know some of you, who are my Planet Fitness people? We got any Planet Fitness folks? So, uh, wow, people actually go to Planet Fitness? That sounds scary. Uh. So, however, based on what the leadership team determined, we decided that we're going to go in the bridge building business. I know, it's a pretty big departure, everybody. So today, and today only, we are going to kick off with a ribbon cutting ceremony, the official Benning Bridge Building Enterprises. That's a tongue twister. So, like I said, I need four volunteers to start up that uh, new business unit. So uh, we'll be on the lookout for that a little bit later. And there will be outstanding prizes. In fact, so much so that there is a wager between Channing and myself for that exercise. But we'll get more into that later. So. Uh, a couple quick items that I want to cover, and for my folks that were here last, I apologize just right at the outset because I am going to kick off with a story that you heard before. I try not to double dip, but because there are a lot more faces and this story is quite pertinent, I'm going to recycle a story. So just bear with me for a moment. A uh, couple years ago, I had a client story. Uh, that actually was very interesting. This client called me up and said, Greg, we are struggling. We are not performing well. Can you help us out? I said, sure, let's hop on a phone call. So picked up the phone. First question I asked him, I said, uh, you know, obviously when you say you're not performing well, that's kind of a big thing. I mean, that, what do you mean you're not performing well? We're, we're not making any money, Greg. We're losing money like you wouldn't believe. Uh, we can't attract people to our business, uh, blah, blah, blah. It's just going badly all around. So I said, OK, well, how do you kick off your projects? So from the time you're awarded a project to the time that you mobilize, what does that process look like? And they said, well, Greg, an average project for us is $150 million. I said, average? I said, yeah, an average project size is $150 million average. So, OK. Uh, I said, well, so how do you kick off that project? They said, well, Greg, normally what we do is we put a three ring binder together, we stuff it full of goodies, and then we hand it to the superintendent and say, go forth and build. And I said, that's it? That's your planning? And they said, yeah, pretty much. I said, well, how do you do it closing out jobs? You know, getting done done. And he said, Greg, we cannot finish jobs to save our life. We got punch list a mile long. Uh, we can't get any of the closeout documents, our as-builds, the testing and commissioning. 
you name it, we suck at finishing. Uh, their words, not mine. And on top of that, we also just can't seem to, uh, you know, make the clients happy at the end. I said, okay. I said, do you do any sort of autopsy or post-job review? And he said, Craig, we don't do planning at the beginning of the job. What makes you think we do it at the end of the job? I said, duly noted. The third question, or rather, it would be the fourth question I asked him was, how about your people? You mentioned you're having trouble attracting people. And his answer was, Greg, I know no one at Benning has ever said this, but Greg, we can't find good people. There's no people in the marketplace that want to be in construction. Well, I'm telling you this, and you're probably wondering why I'm telling you this. Uh, the reason this client was so interesting is because they were in Moscow, Russia. And a couple of years ago, I actually had the opportunity to work with a contractor, not too dissimilar from you guys, in Moscow, Russia. And uh, so I officially can say I have Russian friends. Uh, I'm not running for office, so I think that's okay. Uh, that being said, this company was $2.5 billion in revenue a year. So uh, multiply what you guys are doing by whatever that number would be, 200. I mean, that's a huge, huge organization. Uh, so I got to work with them, and everything they said was, you know, what I would consider symptomatic of our industry. As Darcy said at the beginning, a lot of the things you're going to hear me say today prove that you're not alone in this battle. Probably some of the things I said already, you're kind of going, huh, that sounds like the old company I worked for. Uh, I know a lot of you have kind of come from other parts of the business. Hopefully none of you said, boy, that sounds a lot like Benning. But I'm sure there are some things we're not doing well. Uh, all that being said, here's a company in Moscow, Russia, almost, what is it, 8,000 miles away and eight time zones from here. Yet everything I described was probably like a contractor here in Atlanta, America, Florida, wherever you want. So my point of today is, how do we avoid looking like that type of organization? How do we avoid this? So you'll notice I have People's Exhibit A up here at the front of the room. The Starbucks cup of coffee. It's empty. Got to get myself going in the morning. I uh, had a client, the gentleman's name is Troy. Uh, he's up in just outside of Cincinnati, Ohio. And I, he called me one morning, I was in the Atlantic, or excuse me, the Tampa airport, ironically flying to Atlanta, and he called me up and said, Greg, why don't my guys make the Starbucks cup of coffee? Think about that for a second. Why don't my guys make the Starbucks cup of coffee? Now, mind you, this was 6.30 in the morning. Now, what's that? It's like the Starbucks sucks. <laughs> Blasphemy! Blasphemy! <laughs> are you are you a Dunkin' guy? Oh, you're a uh, QT? Is that? I normally make my own. Oh, okay. <laughs> See, I'm a, I like now. I don't like all that. My wife likes the Frappadappuccinos and all that yeah. stuff. I just want the Starbucks cup of coffee, which kind of goes to the point I'm going to make. Some of you may be Dunkin' guys. Uh, and I I do the Keurig because it is actually cheaper. <laughs> but my point is, mm. calls me up at six thirty in the morning. Now I'm kind of an early morning riser, like a lot of the supers in the room. But 6.30 in the morning getting a phone call, especially for what I do for a living, is a little bit unusual. He calls him, and that, no, no hello, no good morning, Greg. He just says, Greg, why don't my guys make the Starbucks cup of coffee? And I said, Troy, what the heck are you talking about? He goes, Greg, I did a little research here, and I want to kind of drop some knowledge on you. Uh, Starbucks. They do about $17 billion in revenue annually and growing at an exponential rate. So they make a lot of revenue. They have close to 20,000 employees worldwide. How many people does uh, Benning have? What did Channing say? Buck 25? You got 125 Somewhere plus around plus? 100 plus. So you got 100 plus people here. Starbucks has close to 20,000 people worldwide. And when I went to Moscow, by the way, I went to the Starbucks right near the Kremlin just because I had to test it out. And you know what? My theory stays the same. And I'll tell you what the theory is. No matter where you go in the world, you get the same Starbucks cup of coffee. 
Would you all agree with that? Now, my friend here doesn't like Starbucks, but I think you'd agree you get the same bad cup of coffee. <laughs> but my point is, the reason I go to Starbucks is because I like the taste of their coffee compared to the other brands out there. Personal taste. But obviously, to do $17 billion in revenue, they must be doing something consistently right. Hence, the Starbucks cup of coffee. But how do they do that with 20,000 employees? Oh, and by the way, they have an infinite menu. What do I mean by infinite menu, my friend? Do you know what, I, you know what I'm talking about? They have an infinite menu? I don't shop at Starbucks. Oh, okay. So <laughs> you, Fair you, enough. You can make whatever you want, any combination. Yeah, I get the pretty much the black cup of coffee, but you, when you go to Starbucks, you can get the double whip latte thing, blah, blah, blah. And you can go to the same Starbucks here in Atlanta, get that same special drink, and it looks the same, feels the same, consistently. Now, what Troy, my friend in Cincinnati, was getting at was he goes, Greg, we have 10 project managers here. 10. You can count them on two hands. How come we have 12 ways of doing things here? They have 20,000 people, yet they make the same cup of coffee. And I told this story to one of my clients, and of course there was a, a naysayer in the group and said, Greg, there's a little different here. You know, we're a construction organization. Starbucks just makes a simple cup of coffee. To which my response was this. You know, I get the Starbucks cup of coffee. I think this cup of coffee was $3.25 this morning. It is kind of a ripoff. It's a ripoff because it's brown water, put another way. But how about this? I remember my dad used to always tease me when I'd get a Starbucks cup of coffee. He'd go, I remember when coffee was a nickel a cup of coffee or something. Maybe that's like what it is with your coffee because you're making it at home or what have you, or your trailer. They took a commodity good and made it this kind of expensive product, something that was probably a couple pennies to make. They're charging three bucks a pop for. And this is the simple one. And people say, oh, that's probably a ripoff. Probably it is. But you know what they managed to do? Make $20 billion in revenue while making a premium or a commodity good. I use the word commodity a couple times. What is also considered a commodity service in this world? And we've got a good example of a commodity business where you're bid out against your closest friends on every single project. Anybody have an example of a commodity industry out there? Guys, you're sitting in one. We get bid every single time in this world. Now, the good news is you negotiate a lot. But for my estimators in here, I don't know who my estimators are again, you see this all the time. You know, where Publix will come to you and say, we have this new store in anywhere of Ville America. Uh, can you do it for X? And then they try to whittle you down. The point is, we are commodity business, just like the coffee business. My point is, how do we get closer to the Starbucks cup of coffee, or the Dunkin' brand of coffee, if you prefer? How do we get closer? And doing that the Benning way. Not necessarily the Greg way, Steve way, uh, Channing way, but the Benning way. What does that look like? That's where we're going to spend the lion's share of our time. So quickly, a lot of you, uh, hopefully you can see this on the screen, I, I dare not turn out the lights. <laughs> I'm sure a couple of you will completely check out. Good bless you in the back. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this. By the way, the books in front of you are yours and yours to keep. I think we even have a couple extra for friends that weren't able to make it out today. Please, write in them, make notes. Additionally, you're going to see a lot of examples in here. They're examples of tools and processes that I've created with clients. Uh, in fact, Alden has requested one of these already, and he had them yesterday. We didn't get to cover it. Uh, but if there's something in here that you would like, I don't want you to recreate the wheel, guys. Just email me, contact me, and say, hey, can you send me this template? The only caveat I have is that you work together to make it a bedding tool. 
So I'll kind of ask you to do the scout's honor and you know uh, take an oath that I will take this and work together to make it part of the institution of Benning, not just the Greg thing, the Steve thing, the Mary thing. Um, so write in your books, make notes, do whatever you got. These are your workbooks. But this slide up here, um, you'll notice if you kind of see Mr. Herbert is there in the, uh, in the hole. And there's actually the caption that I removed off of this. The caption says something like this, unfortunately due to budgetary constraints, we've had to let Herbert go. <laughs> and I actually uh, have seen this quite a bit. We're doing, uh, as you probably heard in Florida, there's a lot of construction going on, just like there ever is everywhere else in the world. But where I live, there's actually a, a municipal project. Uh, it's, they're enlarging a couple county roads, and I live in the sticks. Um, so this was going on as my wife and I kind of pulled up, or a scene something like this. So we pull up to the stoplight, and this scene was playing out. A bunch of guys standing around looking at one guy who was actually being productive, or seemingly productive. So my wife said to me, uh, and by the way, after 15 years, I'm pretty sure my wife hasn't got a clue what I do, um, because we pulled up the stoplight, she goes, there you go, Mr. Consultant. Why don't you go fix them? I said, well, I don't think they asked for any help. I said, number two, okay. She goes, well, what would you do? How would you help that company since you're Mr. Specialty Consultant Guy? I said, thanks, honey. I appreciate the vote of endorsement. I said, you know what I would do? If I was with this company right here, I would go back and fire senior management. And my wife turns to me in the car and she goes, are you an idiot? She goes, what kind of consultant are you? You know, you mustn't have a clue what you're doing. Now obviously I think we can all get that I'm being somewhat snarky and tongue in cheek here. The point is, I don't think any of our crews, any of our subcontractors roll up to our job site and go, hey, you know what? I'm going to do a crappy job at work today. Now some of you might say, well, you haven't met my subs, Greg. but..." I can say for the most part, I think even your own people, even yourselves, none of you roll over in the morning, kind of kiss your spouse goodbye and go, hey, honey, I'm going to do a crappy job at work today. Maybe Darcy, maybe you do that. Yes. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, most of us, I think, kind of go, hey, you know what? Today's Friday. We're going to rock it. Then you get to work. You get to your project. You get to your trailer. And then this happens. We don't have our plans. We don't have the specs. We don't have RFI number 35 answered. We're waiting on the city. We're waiting on materials to be delivered. Our sub is holding us up. And then things come to a screeching halt. And that's when this scene plays out. So my comment to my wife was, are we thinking about the crew as the center of our universe? Now I realize Benning brokers a lot of its work to subcontractors. And you go, well, we're kind of prisoners to our subcontractors to some extent. At the end of the day, are we making and setting our subcontractors up to be successful? Are we doing all the things necessarily to, to make sure they're as productive as possible? Because if they make money, we succeed. You know, I always hate, I'm sure a lot of you have gone out and bought a car before. And have you ever heard this line when you're out buying a car, you go, you know, I want that car for $25,000. And they go, oh. I guess I'll do it, but I'm losing money on this deal. Have you ever heard that before? You know what? I don't want him to lose money. First of all, that's the stupidest line I've ever heard in my life. And in fact, I told, uh, you, you never want to sell me a car because I will absolutely, it's the one thing I could probably outsmart them on. And I go, that's the dumbest business model. If you think that's what's going to put me over the top, I want you to make money. Do you want your subcontractors to make money? Absolutely. They're for-profit businesses, just like Publix should want Benning to make money. The theater business should want Benning to make money. Yeah, there's the old adage of, uh, was it pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered? You know, hopefully we're somewhere in between that because we want to be healthy. But at the same time, to do that, we have to be doing things productive. I was with a client last week in Nashville, and this was an absolute train wreck. Um, they bid projects at 35% gross margin. Sounds good, right? 
Guess how much money they're actually making? About 4%. Can anyone do the math there? They are making, or excuse me, they're making 4%. So we're talking they're roughly in the ballpark of a 20 to 25 point slide or margin erosion. And you ask the CEO, by the way, they do about $100 million a year. They're a civil contractor that self-performs uh, things like explosive demolition, uh, pay, uh, asphalt pavement, concrete, utilities, yet they're losing money like you wouldn't believe. And I asked the owner, I said, how could that possibly happen? He said, Greg, well, customers just come to us and we throw a huge number at it and we hope it sticks. And you know what, they take us up on that and then we kind of panic and we try to do the work, but we absolutely miss. The question I have for this group is, what happens when the market shifts? What happens when the market collapses? And, and this is not meant to be a, a Debbie Downer moment, but look, the economy is going to backslide at some point in time. That's what happens. So the question I have for you is, how does this company survive in that type of a market? This is the audience participation part of the program. <laughs> How does a company survive? Do they survive? Yeah, a lot of what's happening is they have no discipline in what they're chasing and what they're not chasing. But here's the other thing is when they get a project, they don't do any planning. They're awful at closeout. None of their superintendents plan week to week. They have a million emergency calls to the shop and yard. Uh, they do have trade partners or trade contractors that work with them. There is no coordination. There's no dialogue. Uh, they don't track anything. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about cost reports. Hopefully you're looking at cost reports. Guess what? No one in their company looks at cost reports. The superintendents don't get cost reports here. Okay. Well, this company has no cost reports. This is the civil contractor. This is the civil contractor. Yeah, I mean, not, not you guys, um, to be clear. So the point is... How do you know how fast you're driving when you don't even have a speedometer on? And I could make an argument, by the way, that should superintendents see how we're performing. And I'm not going to get in that philosophical quagmire <clears throat> debate, but, but I can tell you, how can I hold people accountable if they don't even know what the score of the game is? But topic for another day. Point is, if the market shifted tomorrow, this company would be bankrupt. How does a company go from making 35% gross to making next to nothing? Oh, and by the way, their overhead is about 4%. How much money did I say they were making? 4%. What does that work out to be math-wise? How much money are they making? Zero. Boom. Interesting piece to think about. So I bring you to this uh, first case study. I've got these peppered throughout. Uh, additionally, I've also got a lot of different stories we'll talk about. But this first one, uh, is actually a mechanical contractor. They are in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, and their claim to fame is they reheated the frozen tundra. Um, those of you who have any Packers fans in here, I know we're in Falcon Country, but if you have any Packers fans in here, they actually put all the thermal coils underneath Lambeau Field, uh, and they told me the story that they can actually turn the heat off on the visiting side, <laughs> so the ground actually freezes on that side. Uh, meanwhile, on the Packers, it's nice and cushy and, you know, but and it's that radiant heat. But here's the interesting point. 20 project managers, 35 superintendents. A lot of labor going on in the field. Uh, no single system or management philosophy. And actually, I asked the accountant, their CFO, I said, tell me, what is your overhead? Now, overhead, I think we can all, just for a sake of discussion, it's keeping the lights on in the building, training, uh, you know, just all the, the back room things. It's the Darcy, it's the me, it's accounting, it's estimating. I asked the CFO, the Alden of this company, I said, uh, hey, uh, what's your overhead? I don't know. I was like, wait a second, aren't you the guy that does the counting of the beans? And he said, yeah, but I don't know. Now, this guy had an MBA, he was a CPA, 
he had more letters after his name. He looked like a doctor. I mean, I was a brilliant dude. But he couldn't tell you their overhead. How does that happen? Well, I asked him, I said, how do you not know that, man? He goes, Greg, he goes, we have 20 project managers that account for things differently. <clears throat> for instance, one of their project managers would buy his own consumable materials. And there was, they had a big warehouse out back. And he had a section of the warehouse in the back where he stored all of the materials, like extra materials. He was running his own warehouse in the warehouse. And if anyone came to him in the company and said, hey man, can I uh, have a box of screws? He'd go, nope. Mike, wait a second, but we all wear the same logo, the same company. Nope, I'm not sharing. 20 guys in this company that didn't share that didn't do it the same way. The best part was, you'll notice this uh, second item here, it says submitted two different tenders or two different bids to the same customer. So this company sent two bids to the same customer one time. And by the way, in an estimating world, has that worked out for you anytime? Imagine sending two bids to Publix. And by the way, it wasn't a multiple choice test. They lost both of them. But they were embarrassed. To this day, the CEO and I kind of joke about it. I'm sure he thinks it's less of a joke than I do. Uh, but I'm like, you remember that time when you guys sent two bids to this guy? Oh, Greg, why do you keep bringing that up? The point was, there was absolutely no consistency. Now, the good news is we have PMs and superintendents in this room. Uh, imagine this. You're working with uh, that guy over there. Now. The good news is you start to know how he operates, right? But think of how many different combinations at Benning you could possibly have for a moment. Just look at the number of folks in this room. You could work on the next job with that guy back there or that guy back there. But what if those three guys do it completely different from each other? Now, before you go do a complicated project, you gotta figure out how he does his work. That's the thing that happened here. 20 managers, 35 different people. How many different combinations could you possibly have in that company? How many Starbucks cups of coffee do you actually get there? The answer is a whole lot of variability. When they finally got their act together, we'll call it, they started to transform the business. And the cool part about this was over a five year span of time, this was, by the way, during the recession that we had. So talk about the worst time for you not to have your ducks in a row was when the worst economic plight hit our country. But you know what they said, let's hunker down. That's a good phrase. We all love that one. Hunker down and we're going to fix this thing. And that's what they did. And over a five year span of time, they put $10 million to the bottom line through better operations, through efficiencies, and finally creating the brand X way, the Benning way of doing things. And that took a lot of change, folks. It took a lot of discipline. And we're gonna go through those things today in a lot more depth. But I think to prime the pump here, as a manager, superintendent, whatever your role is in the organization, how consistent are these methods of operations here? I want you at your table to talk about some specific things. And we've got here, what are these greatest areas of improvement? What are the things that Benning has to improve upon? And I'll give you some for instances. Uh, first and foremost, when you guys kick off projects, that example I gave you just a moment ago, how consistent is it from PM to PM to PM to PM? What about how you guys, the superintendents in here, how well you plan your jobs. Do you follow a single philosophy using the same tool or process to plan out your jobs week to week? Do you have a daily huddle or daily kickoff every day with your trades? What about when you're closing out jobs? Is there an exit strategy, a two minute warning? What about autopsies, post job reviews? Are we have any military guys in here, ex-military? Wow, that's weird. Okay, one. All right, thank you for your service. When you were in the military, did you ever hear the word after action review? Okay. Leave it to the one guy. I'm teasing you. 
Uh, an after action review in the military, and it depends on what branch you're in as well, what they would see, if they had a mission that they went on, they would come back after the mission and go, all right guys, what worked, what didn't work? What did we learn about the enemy? What did we learn about our tactics? And we're gonna put that in the, the library of knowledge and hopefully use that as kind of a reference material for the future. For instance, how many Publix projects is, say that's a really tongue twister too, how many Publix projects uh, do you, have you guys performed here at Benning? Over 200. Okay, over 200 projects. Do you think there are some things that if we took and extracted those 200 things, things about the customer, uh, best practices, things that Publix like, uh, you know, they like a certain tile on the floor, or they like their racks to be a certain way, they like a certain type of equipment, even down to personalities of Publix, you know, yeah, Mr. Jenkins and uh, the whole Jenkins family, how do they operate? The moral of the story is, do we have this library of knowledge about Publix, the theater business, that we could teach younger folks, and I'm not going to pick on the younger folks, because then I'll isolate the older folks, uh, my point is making us institutionally smarter. What about change orders? You know, when you see change orders to handle in this organization, is it the same way or different? What I want you at your table to talk about is how consistent you see operations. What are the greatest areas of need? So of the things I've mentioned, and those are just a sample, you, know, you may see other things. I want you to work at your table for a moment and come up with that list. How are we in terms of consistency, and what are the areas of greatest need? Make sense? Yes. Go to it.